Hello, how are you guys doing out there? James here. I hope you're having a good day, a good night. Well, I decided to go a different direction, and it's something very educational I want to talk about. And it's that currently there's a people at war, and it's, 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 it's Israel. And Israel, it, there's, there's another side of Israel that we hear about, we hear mainstream. This video is not to be anti-Semitic or anything. These people, what I'm about to reveal to you, is for educational purposes only. That's their opinion, and I'm probably I'm gonna give you my opinion after reading this educational fact about Jewish people. Educational purposes only. Today, Kim, as the African Exodus. about like the she and she runs it because in the last few years right especially in 2020 like there's been a conversation around like ally greetings family welcome to the african exodus show i'm your host today sheree here to you with a new video before we get started with today's show just as a reminder if you would like to add yourself to my telegram group that's the best way to get notifications anytime that i post a new video in addition if you feel led to support this channel you can do so through cash app also on PayPal, the link to that is down in the description. And also on Patreon, there I post any type of materials that I also use for the presentation, such as today I'll post the, the PowerPoint from today's presentation of my Patreon. So, so much is going on right now inside of the world. And I really felt led to take a moment and talk about a foundational issue inside of Christianity, one that many people probably don't think about because we look at this as the foundation that we base so much off of, and that is Judaism. So typically in this segment, we talk about coming out of Christianity. That means come out of this religious system that was birthed really inside of, of Roman Catholicism. This religious system, its tentacles reach all throughout the philosophies, the theologies, all throughout the holidays, all throughout so much of the aspects that we have regarded as being biblical, even though they're far from biblical. We have to understand, though, that this origin of a co-optation really goes back from before Christianity was even a religion, before there was ever a pope. This goes back to Judaism. Now we have to understand Judaism is not the followers of Torah necessarily. Followers of Torah, followers of the original word that come, came from Yahuwah, given to the Yashraelites. The law of Yahuwah that was given to the Yashraelites, this is not Judaism. Now we have to make this distinction in this day and time because we see a day and time right now where you can see operating the fulfillment of prophecy happening over inside of Palestine in the state of Israel. We see a fulfillment of so many things that are coming to, finally coming to fruition. And this is the kingdom of Lucifer, when you kind of see how everything is forming, when you see how the world system is backing up a certain people, you can see that Lucifer's, his hand is inside of the entire creation of this system. So for that reason, we have to be clear on where we stand, particularly those of us who are making a real effort to follow the Torah. Many of us are coming out of Christianity, and we're following Yahusha, the son of Elohim. We're following him, and we're following the way that he showed us to follow the Torah. But when we understand
understand that the Torah has a lot of things that are attached to it that are not in the book. If you are not careful, you will be practicing false teachings along with following Torah. You don't make that distinction, then you can easily be led astray by so many of the same forces that have led people astray inside of Christianity. So let's really go to the foundations of this all. I wanted to spend a lot of time talking about this word, this saying inside of scripture called the synagogue of Satan. One that many people have been reflecting on as of recently, as they see a war transpiring, as we see a world system that is backing up a certain nation with impunity. No matter what that nation does, the whole world system will not do anything to stop it from wreaking havoc on the world. And we can see that truly, as we pull in scripture, that Lucifer is the prince of the powers of this world, that truly Lucifer's hand is inside of this entire catastrophe that's happening around the world as we speak. So let's just go to scripture and spend some time on what the scripture says. Revelations 2 and 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Now, of course, the term Jews did not exist at the time of this scripture. The real word that would have been used is Yahudim. Yahudim meaning one of the descendants of the tribes of Judah. So the real reading of the scripture would say, and the slander by those who say they are Yahudim and are not, but are of a synagogue of Satan. So there are people who are saying that they descend from the tribe of Judah, but they do not. And instead, they come out of an assembly. That's what synagogue means break down the meaning, an assembly of Satan. Similarly, Revelations 3, 9 says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Yahudim and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down before your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Now, it's really criminal how little time we spend talking about the synagogue of Satan inside of the institutions, inside of Christianity, inside of churches. We really spend very little time talking about the fact that there's a scripture explicitly telling us that there are a people who are saying that they are Yahudi, yet those people are, in fact, not. Not only are they not, they are being led by Satan, Lucifer, Prince of Lies. They're being led by him. You would think that having a distinction on who those people are would be paramount inside of a faith system that says that they follow Yahusha. This is his words. He's the one saying it. Yet, many people have ignored that scripture, kept reading other parts of the scripture, emphasized other parts that they want to emphasize, and de-emphasize parts that they want to de-emphasize. Instead, we see a alliance with Christianity and Zionism, we see an alliance, this belief that these people are the, who they say they are. We see many people bowing at the feet of those who claim that they are Yahudi. This is obviously a way to manipulate the believers who say that they're believers of Yahusha, manipulate them into perpetuating to a religious system that is not from Yah, to a people's ways, to their politics to their governmental structure that is not being holy by the Most High. So we've been manipulated. Many of us have been manipulated. At one time, I was manipulated by this same system, which is why we have to root it out and deal with it. Now, I want to deal more with the history today, not so much deal with the implications of the scripture. I want us to kind of start to sift through history. When did this institution begin? We will make the... the, the logical explanation obviously that the, that the system has not ended so when did it begin it had to have begun obviously during the exile of Yahudi out of the holy land so we know this by the way because of scripture giving us details of there being a separation between the Levites who were the original priesthood and another people so let's actually go to Yahusha himself what he says inside of Luke 10 Yahushua replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he encountered robbers, and they stripped him and beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. 
And by coincidence, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, something that might not have stood up to you before is the fact that there is a distinction being made between a priest and a Levite. Of course, if you know the scriptures, the Old Testament or the Torah, you know that the Levites were the priesthood. So why is it a distinction between a priest who first goes by, to means on his way, and then a Levite, a blood Levite? What we're being shown here is the fact that at the time of Yahusha, that there was a distinction between the priesthood of the Torah, the priesthood of the law, and a new priesthood. A new priesthood by the time of Yahusha is put in place. A new priesthood is ruling, and that priesthood is the same priesthood that is the co-optation of the original priesthood. So, of course, this means that this had to happen in the Babylonian exile, when the Yahudim were taken into exile into Babylon. So, a few things about the exile that you should um, know. Number one, I want you to understand that the exile was not the complete nation of the Yahudim. That has to be emphasized. In fact, let's talk about the actual numbers according to Scripture. So, according to 2 Kings 24, 12 through 16, it says, Then he led into exile all the people of Jerusalem and all the commanders and all the valiant warriors, 10,000 exiles and all the craftsmen and the smiths. None were left except the poorest of the land. So, this is the initial exile. What we're told in this scripture is that 10,000 exiles were taken to Babylon. Now, it has to be emphasized. This is not a lot of people. Whenever you look at the, the breakdowns of the numbers of people who were inside of Yahuda, the tribe of Yahuda, far more than 10,000 people, right? This is, as it says, a certain class of people. Again, it says that these were the commander of all the valiant warriors, 10,000 exiles, craftsmen, and smiths. Also inside of Jeremiah 52, 28 through 30, it says, these are the people who Nebuchadnezzar took into exile. The seventh year, he took 3,023 Jews, or Yahudim, and the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, 832, from Jerusalem, and the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, took into exile 743 Yahudim, and there were 4,600 people in all. So we have to come away with the conclusion that during the Babylonian exile, although it was powerful, probably the administrators, the people who were of influence inside of Yahuda, the vast majority of the Yahudim were still present inside of Yahuda, the, the, the tribe, right? So this is important to emphasize because a certain level of people are going to go into exile. And when those people, some who are going to come back, not all come back, some people, it's evidence they actually stay in Babylon. They love Babylon so much and they want to integrate into Babylon. So a problem that many of us have today. But um, when some do come back and they actually are coming back in sincerity, we see also that some are coming back who are also coming with a co-opted version of the original truth. So we have to understand what happens inside of the Babylonian exile that actually turns the people of Yahuda away from Yahuwah. We're going to biblicalarchaeology.org. It says, according to the Bible, notes Lori E. Pierce, King Jehoiachin was given special treatment even over other, other imprisoned kings. Moreover, cuneiform rations lists discovered in Nebuchadnezzar's south palace in Babylon show that captive kings and officials, high officials, received monthly rations of grain and oil. The lives of non-royal Jahudites, too, are preserved inside of Babylonian records. Next to Nippur contains the names of Jahudites who served as witnesses in the land contracts. The Judite identity of the witnesses is revealed by their Yahuistic names, names formed from the Israelite divine Yahuwah. The text contains the business activities of a family whose patriarch was an entrepreneur named Marusu. Since witnesses to contracts usually have the same social status as those engaged in a transaction, as we suggest, Lori, he argues, 
that a number of Jehudites were as successful as the Marusu family. So what this tells us is even when the scriptures were written, come out of her, saying come out of Babylon, that even the real Babylonian empire that existed at the time, many people were living comfortably. Many people were not in angst. Now, yes, some people were in devastation, particularly the ones who were left inside of Yahuda, but many people basically assimilated into the society. Many people joined in Babylon, and many people did not have a unfavorable experience by their own estimation. I'll give you another version. Today I'm going to show you something so evil and so vile in this book right here, which I'll be showing you in closer detail. Um, that's probably going to really shock you. And it is certainly something that the Talmudic rabbis uh, do not want people to understand. They don't want people to know. What I have here is the Talmud, the, Sin, the Stein Salts edition, volume 7, tractate, Kitabut, part 1. You can see it right there. I did a video on these a little while ago, the whole set. We have the whole thing. It cost us over $2,000 for this. Um, and the fruits of this are going to start paying off. Um, right now, believe it or not, my son, my 10-year-old son, is actually going through one of these, and he's writing down notes for me. So anything he sees that's heretical or nonsense, he's actually writing notes. He's got, I think, uh, somewhere around 40 or 50 different <laughs> uh, page numbers and, and notes. The uh, Lord is blessing my son greatly. I'm actually really blown away by it. Please do pray for Oliver. Um, the Lord's doing a real work in my son's life. And he, he actually asked to do it. He said, Father, could I start looking through those? I'd like to find some things, see what they actually say. And uh, it's amazing what the Lord is doing. And I think it's a lot of you have been praying for him, so I think that, that has a lot to do with it. But um, I'm very blessed to have a son like him. But um, I'm going to show you something here, um, which is going to be very horrible. And I'm not going to read certain parts because of YouTube's policies and, and things. And so I'm, I'm going to let you read it. And I don't really like to read horrible looking stuff like this. Uh, let me zoom out here a little bit first. Okay. Mishnah, whatever the Hebrew is there, it has already been established in a previous Mishnah above uh, 10b that a woman who is presumed to be to presume to be a virgin at the time of her marriage is entitled to a ketubah of 200 denarium, whereas a woman who is presumed to be a non-virgin at the time of her marriage is entitled to a ketubah, marriage agreement is what a ketubah is, of 100 denarium, a mena, whatever the Mishnah we are about uh, to consider continues in its efforts to determine which women are considered virgins for the purpose of the ketubah and which are treated as non-virgins. If a grown-up man has intercourse with a less than three years old. Are you seeing this? And they're not condemning this. Or if a young boy less than nine years old has had with a grown woman. Or if a woman has been injured by a stick and as a result her, sorry about that, has been ruptured. In each of these cases, the woman is entitled to a ketubah of 200 denarium when she marries. Okay, and you can keep on reading there. You can pause it and read it if you really want to. Um, now, I take great issue with that. My son, which I mentioned earlier, is 10 years old. And according to this Satanism right here, um, a woman, a Jewish woman, could have a uh, relationship with my 10-year-old. And um, if I was a Jew, hey, that three-year-old girl over there, she's really hot. Excuse me? And this is what these uh, Jews at the Torah Institutes are learning. I'm going to go learn the Talmud. I mean, maybe they're not all learning the Talmud and things, but a lot of them do. It takes seven years to go through this garbage. I wonder what kind of uh, horrible things go on in these families, between these families when their holy book right here that they deny the word of God to 
uplift this. And this holy book says, three-year-old girl, if you're a man, you're a woman, ten-year-old, or a nine-year-old, excuse me, nine-year-old boy. Oh, well, that's just conspiracy stuff. That's been debunked. We've done, we fact-checked it, and it's not true. Uh, I just showed it to you. Overhead camera just showed you the page and the quotes right here. That's why they're so evil. That's why they're so bad. Are they? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But let me give you a verse of scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Hmm. Jump up two verses to verse 13. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious... But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Did you know that Jesus Christ died for sinners? Did you know that Paul said that he was the chiefest of sinners? Paul was a Jew. Okay, read Romans chapter 11. Um, of the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, Paul talks about being a Jew over and over again. And what a lot of you people forget out there is... You look at something like that that I just showed you, and you say, oh, wicked. Oh, I just, oh, I just can't rip their throat down. Do this kind of thing. You forget the message of the scriptures, that Jesus Christ came to his own, and his own received him not. Well, you see, then they're done. No, because Paul wasn't done. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Oh, but uh, sorry, Saul, because you're those wicked Jews. Those evil, horrible, Talmudic Jews. And a lot of these traditions, they go back, by the way, into the B.C. years. You know, before Christ. That's what B.C. means. Uh, it's not B.C.E., before the common era. Uh, before the common era <laughs> with the whole system. No, it's before Christ. And A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. That's the way it's supposed to be. Um, Jesus Christ is God. God manifests in the flesh. I've proved it for years and years. It's what the King James Bible teaches. And you wicked Jews out there, you qualify to be saved. Your sin qualifies you. It is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. Gentiles and Jews. doesn't matter where you're from. If you're a sinner, a wicked, filthy, Talmud-observing, Jew, you can be saved. Jesus shed his blood on the cross to pay for your sins. He can wash them all away. If you accept him, he can make you a new creature. Saul was a Christian murdering Jew. Hunted Christians down. Hailing men and women, committed them to prison. He watched them die. Probably enjoy, well, I, I know he enjoyed it. He, he watched uh, uh, Stephen. Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8 goes into, and he watched Stephen die. Watched him be stoned to death. They laid his, their coats down at Saul's feet, and Saul's just standing over there going, I've got another one. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> Boy, they hit him good on that one. Boy, yeah, oh, I heard the skull crash. Yeah, he's done now. Plays there, and there's just a pool of blood coming out of Stephen's head. <laughs> alright back to work time to go kill some more God saved him um, are the Jews doing some things that are really wicked right now yes they are should you get upset about it as a Christian yes you should should you uh, expose their sin yes God is no respecter of persons you shouldn't be either I shouldn't be Raise up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their sins. Spare not. I'm not sparing any of you wicked Jews out there. You need Jesus. He's your only hope. And you Christians out there that get such an attitude against these Jewish people to the point where you just want to see them killed and slaughtered in large numbers and whatever else and you lose your mercy, you're forgetting the message of the New Testament, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't forget it. The vilest offender 
that truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. If the old hymn says, oh, unless you don't believe that. Jesus only died for the Gentile Christians, huh? And a few Jews in the early part of the first century there. But these Jews of today, they're just wicked. They're just horrible town, but it's satanic synagogue of Satan. It was before a persecutor, a blasphemer, injurious, whatever else. Um, to the Jews out there, don't go walking around acting like you're holier than Christians. You've got some special little road to the, the name Hashem. You know, I've got some guy, you know, I worship the name. Sounds like some kind of Hollywood actor that's screwed up in the head from years of drug abuse. Uh, you don't have some special inroad. We do. Our New Testament is based on better things than what you had in the Old Testament. And Jesus died. And you actually have an advantage as a Jew, by the way. Okay? Uh, physical Jews have an advantage. Romans chapter 3. Read it. Verses 1 through 6. Read it. Don't give me the spiritual Jew thing there in chapter 2, verse 28 through 29. It could, continues into chapter 3. Okay? <laughs> okay? Yes, we are born in with the spirit of adoption. We become spiritually Jewish. Yes, I get that. Um, I'm connected to a Savior that's Jewish, so that would make me, I'm part of his body, well then that would make me spiritually similar to the Jews there, the spirit of adoption and everything else. Um, that's true. But there's also the physical Jews, and they have an advantage if you give up this kind of satan satanic, uh, horrible stuff here. So, we'll be coming out with a lot more stuff on the Talmud as we have time, as we go through it. And I say we because my whole family is involved in this. My wife, myself, and my son. My little 10-year-old boy. And um, if you really can call yourself looking in the mirror, if you're Jewish, you can look in the mirror and say, I believe in a system that says it's okay to molest a 3-year-old girl or a 9-year-old boy. And if you think that God is leading you right now, you might want to check into who that God is that's leading you. Because it's not Jehovah God. Okay? I pray that you think about this. Time is running out for you. We're heading for the time of Jacob's trouble. And the vast majority of Jews are going to be killed in that time. And now you know why. I've got to share this. Your car insurance company does not want you to know about this, but there is a free savings tool that can help... You can convert to Judaism. You can't convert to a blood family. You can't convert, you cannot convert to a race. Judaism is a religion. That's all it is. Judaism is a religion. That's all it is. Judaism is a religion. That's all it is. Jewish identities have evolved in different directions, and that's what's causing the confusion today. A little history is in order. A history of Zionism in Israel. They call themselves the Jewish state. What exactly is a Jewish state? Now, uh, normally, the way states are created, the way people are created, let's say this country, United States of America, we, we were here in the colonies, and we wanted to break off from the British, and those people who were here became the citizens of the United States. But that's clearly not what happened in Israel. In Israel, you're talking about a case, a strange case, a historical anomaly, where the people had to come into a land the people existed before the land. Now you have nationalities without lands, let's say the Kurds for example. But there you're talking about people who, who, who according to the Zionists, existed first and then they came into some land. And somehow that land became the Jewish state. Marsha Gessen describes one of two Jewish states created in the world. The Jewish state that you know about is Israel. The one you probably haven't heard of, the one that Gessen writes about, is called Bureau Bijan. It was created after the Bolshevik Revolution as a Jewish autonomous region. Jews who moved there had hoped to create a place of safety where Jewish culture and the Yiddish language could thrive. That's not how it worked out. The history of Bureau Bijan is told in Gessen's new book, Where the Jews Aren't. She's a journalist who's also written books about Vladimir Putin, the Russian punk band Pussy Riot, and the Sarnayev brothers who bombed the Boston Marathon. 
Gessen grew up in the Soviet Union, deprived of many rights because she's Jewish. She emigrated with her family to the U.S. in 1981 when she was 14. As a journalist, she returned to Moscow, but she had to flee a second time to avoid a law that would have enabled the government to take away her adopted son because she's a lesbian. Masha Gessen, welcome back to Fresh Air. So just give us the basic outline of what was Berobijan. So Berobijan was and actually still is nominally one of the two Jewish states in the world. Uh, the other one obviously being Israel. But Berobijan was formed earlier. It was part of a Soviet experiment. The Soviet Union initially conceived itself as a sort of anti-imperial empire in which every nation had the right to self-determination and to some sort of autonomy. And the Jews who had, before the revolution, lived in the Pale of Settlement and had, um, had very limited civil rights were supposed to be emancipated to be like other nations and therefore had to get an autonomy of their own. And so from the Soviet point of view, it was, it was an attempt to make Jews like other ethnic groups living in the Soviet Union. And so they're granted a piece of land on the Soviet-Chinese border, an impossible sort of piece of land to inhabit and, and, and to cultivate. But tens of thousands of Jews moved there at certain times uh, before World War II and then after World War II. How did Zionism start? The Zionists created Zionism in order to solve a problem. What was the problem? Common currency says the problem was anti-Semitism. Well, that's not true. The Zionists did believe that Zionism would end anti-Semitism, not because, like you'll hear people today say, well, the Zionists wanted the Jews to have an army so they can defend us themselves. You will not find such an idea anywhere in early Zionist writings, anywhere. That was political propaganda that developed much, much later. In fact, Max Nordau, Herzl's lieutenant, said that it is not true. He made a protest against those people that think in those days that the purpose of Zionism was a response to anti-Semitism. And I quote, I have it right here. It is not correct to say that Zionism is a gesture of truculence or an act of desperation against anti-Semitism. The effect of anti-Semitism was only to force them to reflect upon their relation to the nations of the world. And that reflection led them to conclusions which would endure in their minds and hearts even if anti-Semitism were to disappear completely. Anti-Semitism taught the Zionists something about themselves. That even without anti-Semitism, if anti-Semitism would disappear off the face of the earth, they would still have created Zionism. Anti-Semitism taught them something that wanted them to become Zionists. It taught them about a problem in the Jewish people. Anti-Semitism was not the problem in and of itself. What was? Well, we spoke before about anti-Semites. Which anti-Semite do you think said the following? The Jewish people are a very nasty people. Its neighbors hate it, and they're right. Its end will be a Bartholomew night. They'll all be massacred. Now, Holocaust deniers are bad, but a Holocaust justifier is worse. The Jewish people is a very nasty people. Its neighbors hate it and they are right. Its end will be a Bartholomew night. Vladimir Jabotinsky. If the tables were turned, another one says, and others were like the Jews, wouldn't we have good cause to hate them as well? Josef Chaim Brenner, another one of the original Zionists. How about this one? Those loathsome Jews are vomited out by any healthy collective and state, not because they're Jews, but because of their Jewish repulsiveness. Uri Tzvi Greenberg, another one of the early Zionists. The Zionists were secular Jews who absorbed the attitudes of the anti-Semites and looked at the Jews themselves with the same disgust and loathing that the anti-Semites did. I'm going to give you two quotes said by two different people. Take a guess who said them. They're almost the same. Quote number one. The Jews are described the religious Jews. Sterile Jewish masses living parasitically off the body of an alien economic body. I know it's a little redundant, but you gotta bear with the guy. Quote number two. Never in 
nomad, but only and always a parasite in the body of other peoples. Also about the Jews. Who do you think said these things? Well, quote number two was Adolf Hitler, Mein Kampf, chapter 11. Quote number one was David Ben-Gurion, Imam Ad-Laam, page 269. You know that Judicial Watch is one of the most widely supported public policy groups in the country, and there's a lesson there, isn't there? To 69. The Zionists' problem was that they learned from the anti-Semites how disgusting the Jews were. And the reason the Jews were disgusting was because they looked like me, and they acted like me. And they blamed me, the religious Jews, for anti-Semitism. What did they hate about us? I'll come back to what Gillett said. Gillett mentioned, and he said I disagree, and I will, about problematic statements in the Bible and the Talmud, racist statements, militaristic statements, statements about killing races and people like that. I'll tell you something about the Talmud and the, the Bible. Everyone knows that Orthodox Jews don't merely follow the Bible, you also follow the Talmud, but not only the Talmud, it's the entire body of rabbinic literature. Here's how this works. The verses of the Bible and the pages in the Talmud are kind of like ingredients in a recipe. Taking a, a statement out of the, the Bible and saying, well, uh, God told Joshua to kill the inhabitants of Canaan is kind of like saying, look at this recipe, it has vinegar in it. And guessing from the ingredient what the final outcome will be. The verses in the Bible and the pages of the Talmud are ingredients, the oral law is to us a instruction how to put the ingredients together how to cook them and different rabbis are better skilled at it than others some come out with the most beautiful culinary uh, masterpieces and some just can bake a you know Betty Crocker cake Duncan Hines so there are different levels of rabbis different levels of creativity but the oral Torah to us our Torah is basically a, a, a method of taking the Bible and taking the Talmud and coming out with a final recipe. What's the final recipe? Well, we have those verses that Gilad referred to. We also have a verse where God told King David that he's disqualified from building our temple because he was a warrior. We have verses in the Talmud that say when the Jews are in exile, we are not allowed to wage wars against the nations even when the nations attack us. We're supposed to run, and we did run. And the Zionists hated us for this. They hated us for not being militaristic. They hated us for not being like them. They hated us for, for, for being meek. And they hated us for running. And they hated us for not defending ourselves. We will not. Throughout our exile, God said to us, that's part of your, your punishment and part of the way we keep you safe. You do not wage war. You do not uh, kill other people. Collectively, you don't. There's one exception. One exception. If anybody dares attack our religion, not us, you attack us, we'll run. You attack our religion, you try to get us to convert. Then, in horror, will we rise up against our enemies, not as warriors, not as attackers, but with the same emotion that even the most pacifist mother would have when a band of kidnappers come to take away her children, she'll grab a kitchen knife if necessary, and with no regard for her personal safety, she will attack. With that same emotion, with love for our God and our religion, without any regard for our safety, we will rise up like a lioness to protect what is most valuable to us and what we love the most in the world. And if God wants us to die like that mother, it's not our safety that we were worried about. We were trained to do that. The Zionists created Zionism to extinguish Jewishness from the Jew. They wanted a militaristic Jew. They were ashamed of the way the Jews acted. They were ashamed in the face of the anti-Semites and in the face of the world. They thought that the reason the anti-Semites hate the Jews is because they act like we do. Jews were not interested in culture or art. They were interested in Torah. There was no such thing as Jewish art, there's no such thing as Jewish sports. You go through the whole Talmud, you won't find any reference to sports. And I'll tell you something about the language Yiddish. In Yiddish, there are no idioms that make
make reference to military uh, expressions or, or, or uh, physical strength expressions. In English, we say a guy, he hit below the belt, he's behind the eight ball. Oh, he hit a home run. In Yiddish, there is, he slaughtered, Yankee slaughtered the Mets. You will not find any such idioms in Yiddish. Because Yiddish is a reflection of our lifestyle, not our culture. There's no culture. We wanted, we had our values. The Zionists hated our values and they were ashamed of it. So they created Zionism to destroy our values. How did they want to destroy our values? Here's what they did. In the day that, 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 that the Zionists came, with it, came about, the early days of Zionism, nationalism was, was sweeping throughout Europe. They took nationalism and said, you know what? Everybody's becoming a nation and so great for them. Let's become a nation too. And if we become a nation, guess what's going to be? We won't look at ourselves as a religion. We'll look at ourselves as a nation. For example, let's say I wanted to tell the Christians that they shouldn't practice Christianity anymore. Well, I could try to convince them not to practice Christianity. And the Zionists want the Jews not to practice and believe in Judaism. But that probably won't work. So what I'll do instead is this. I'll tell all the Christians that Christianity is not a religion. It's really a baseball team. Jesus was the, the, the manager. And all the Gospels were all stars. And this crazy idea that, that Christianity is a religion was made up by priests and stuff in exile because they got messed up in the head. But really, Christianity is a baseball team. I'm going to get a, a stadium and I'm going to print, uh, make uniforms, pinstripes that says Christians over it. I'm going to get them bats and balls to play so they can play in the major league of nations. And I'm going to convince them that if you really want to be a good Christian, Learn how to play ball. Forget about this religious stuff. Learn how to play ball. That's what the Zionists did, except instead of a baseball team, they went to try to convince the Jews that the Jewish, Jewish people are a nation, like France and like Spain. We'll get the land. That's Israel. That's a, our stadium. We'll get baseball bats and balls. We'll create a language. They sat down to create a language because nations need languages. They sat down to create a language because nations need languages. They sat down to create a language. They sat down to create a language. They sat down to create a language. And for a few years, very briefly, the official language of this region was Yiddish. So it's probably the only Yiddish-speaking state that has ever existed. And, you know, I think some of the attraction of the idea of Bira Bajan to Soviet Jews was that it would be a place where Yiddish would be the language because, as you say, Hebrew was the language in Israel. And there was a lot of fear that Yiddish was dying out. And that fear has been absolutely uh, proven to be true. Um, Yiddish is hardly a, a functioning language in the, in the world anymore. So so that, that was also really appealing. Oh, absolutely. And... Um Yiddish, you know, it's it's fascinating what's happened to Yiddish over the course of the 20th century, and obviously the fact that six million Jews, many of whom were Yiddish speaking, were killed in the Holocaust, contributed to the death of the language. So it's not uh, um, at the time that people were discussing uh, Berbijan and the threat to Yiddish that nobody could have conceived of that. And that's, um, I mean, that's another thing that that interested me in the story of Berbijan was that this whole discussion was happening on the eve of catastrophe that no one could have imagined. Um, and how we understand it is colored by this catastrophe. But, but getting back to, to the subject of Yiddish, there were a number of Yiddish language writers in what was then the Soviet Union who were very interested in Berbijan for that specific reason, because Yiddish in their minds had sort of um, evolved very quickly from a purely spoken language, sort of the household language of the of the Jews in diaspora, to a literary language, to a language of culture. Uh, and it was, at the time, it was a very progressive movement, um, and there was a lot of interesting experimentation happening in Yiddish literature, precisely because it was such a revolutionary act to start writing and creating literature in a language that had been perceived as sort of the language of the household. I mean, my own great-grandmother always referred to Yiddish as the jargon. She was a literary woman. She had grown up speaking Yiddish. But to her, it wasn't a language of literature. It wasn't a language of culture. So that idea in itself was, it, it, it sort of was synergetic with the whole pathos of the Bolshevik Revolution and this idea of creating culture 
out of things that had been disregarded before. So Birabidjan was granted the status of Jewish Autonomous Region in 1934, and a resolution declared, for the first time in the history of the Jewish people, its burning desires for a homeland, for the achievement of its own national statehood, has been fulfilled. So this is 1934. I'm going to go ahead and cut it. Um, I'm going to chime on in. Um, it's kind of fun. It's kind of strange because here, you know, when you, when you look at the studies, um, Hebrew, the, I think the first language in the land, in ancient land, was uh, Aramaic. And then, it, it, you know, the, the surrounding regions with, with uh, Arabia, Arab, Greek, and Hebrew, and Yiddish was not one one of the languages that was even spoken during their time. So, how did it how did it become? And it's pretty much telling you the story right there. So, really, majority of those people probably speak Yiddish, mixed in with some probably some Hebrew. You heard it from them themselves. And so we see the other part of the side and the reason why they don't want that information released. And if you don't show actual data, you're anti-Semitic. You tell the truth on them, they use it as a weapon, you're anti-Semitic. Actually, when you're showing people actually that in their community is actually saying this. In their own words, telling their own history about Jewish, the state of Israel, and how they become, and how they punish people. And when other people were pointing this out, they didn't like that. It was really the Zionism. It wasn't the Jewish that had a problem. It sounded like there was the people who was a sector of that, which he mentioned was the Zionists. The Zionists didn't want that truth out. The Zionists the one that punishing Kanye. It's the Zionists that try to punish Kyrie, anybody that speak on that. And you have to go and apologize to, to the Jews. It was the Zionists. It's the Zionists that control your politics. It's the Zionists that's behind the war. And really, what Netanyahu is a Zionist. Because he probably speaks Yiddish. Most of his language. So really, when they say, so the, technically, most of those people are saying it was right. That surrounding their neighbors were right. Then we say that, then we train that, they, why don't they go out and get out of the country, the, the, you know, the Palestinians and other people, when they were there long before they, they really was, because they were, they, they're descendants of the Ottoman in, the, in relations to that. That's why the people don't understand what this really a war. That's why they have a connection. And all the people are connected. They're brothers. Yet, um, Libya, they're brothers by the faith, and some of them are brothers, brothers and cousins by the blood. So when you jump on Israel just tapping each each of the family members, that's how it became this war. And then they want to choose a, choose a narrative. It's the Zionists that own everything. When they say that and it was history showed that how they input their hands in media and the banking system and everything. They moved up and they moved fast up in politics. And that's what currently is. And when you point this out, you're being anti Semitic. Now you see why people starting really cause then it puts the people who are Jewish who are not like that in arms way. Like even as we speak, there are Jewish people Paying the price of Zionism. That's getting their lives taken. It's not, but the Zionists saying that it's the, it's, it's the ones that Hamas is doing and other ones. But if that was the case then, why did Hamas release the, release the hostages? Those, those hundred hostages. I'm not sticking up for either one, but you know, I'm just, I'm just evaluating truth. I'm not even either side, but it's like how can you sit up there and now this is how 
it's not the Jewish people. It is the ones that's in the government that is the Zionists. That's what that man was talking about. The Jewish man was talking about. That's the one who's doing causing all this stuff. And that's who they're fighting. They're not fighting the Jewish people. They're fighting the Zionists. The Zionists that want to control everything. They have power in every area. They've been had it for centuries. And when people point that out, celebrity or big voice point out, they in their career. It's the Zionists that do it. It's the Zionists that, you know, shut people, shut down and control the media, social media and everything. It's not the Jewish people. It's not the Jewish people. But they hide behind the Jewish people. And some of them don't even believe in the Torah. Some of them, Zionists are atheists. They're atheists. They don't believe in Christ, the one who's on the cross. There's been there's been a video showing that if you, they call the Zionist ones is to call you wearing the cross around your your neck. You are not you're an idolater. This coming out their own mouth. A lot of Christians don't even know that. We're supposed to be, and then you know. And Christians over there trying to bring them the gospel. And they get, they get spit at. Not by Muslims, but by, by them. But yet, we're supposed to be one. And then, is led to believe that they told the whole world that they're the chosen ones. That they was the Israel that and so they they control the images when they tell the story of the Bible. The Zionists even do the control, control that. That's why they want to show the images that the actual people that's in the Bible what they look like. They want to control the images when they tell the story. Mm -hmm. when, they tell, when it's telling the story, that's why they have the people, you know, paintings and the, the movies and stuff. Who signed this? Dressed as Jews. There was an, they, them people were in the, the Caucasus Mountains. And they know they were. And people have proven DNA and everything. People from all walks of life. But when you point that from all walks of life, you're, you're anti-Semitic. <laughs> it, it, it is the own people who are Jewish telling you. But, but when you do it, who's not Jewish, you anti-Semitic. <laughs> the same truth is the person who is Jewish is who was raised Jewish saying the same thing. Go figure that out. Then they ruin on you, take your, attack your, check, your, your social, trying to get you off the internet and everything, and your job and everything. It's the Zionists that's doing that. It's not the Jews. It's the Zionists. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, um, shout out to We Woke, shout out to Afri African ex Exodus and the, and the other guy for pointing it out. But there's some that really follow that taboo with what that one guy talked about and still practice it till this day and only you know go find out how the way they clean a newborn baby boy after they circumcise them there's video out there on that put it this way it's gonna gross you out There's no way in the Bible when you when someone circumcised a child, a baby boy, you do that to a baby boy. Put it to you that way. And those who watched the scene the video, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, it's really uh, be, but God's gonna reveal the truth. He's gonna reveal it. He's gonna reveal who they really, and he's slowly revealing it. And he's going to continually keep seeking for it.
and seek the Holy Spirit. And ask of yourself, who, where do they lie in the scriptures, Father? What, what these people point now? Or they just saying it out of their own. Seek the word for yourself, and the word will reveal itself. All right, then. Take care, guys. Hope you like Joy's video. Hope it's educational for educational purposes only. And I'll see you on this video. Be blessed and take care.